papers end up fulfilling uh, kind of the authentic nature of winemaking that we really appreciate. Um, so the whole theme on this uh, class is is basically like how how do we personify natural wines? What's the discussion around it? Um, but yeah, um, Tony, you want to talk about say a little bit? Uh, no, I'm just glad to be here. It's a really fun topic. Um, as you can see, I am in full costume. I'm probably doing something as a first for Wine and Food Foundation podcast. I am working right now. So <laughs> if you are live streaming from the patio at Jeffrey's, uh, your Petrus is decanting. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, I'm excited about this. I'm glad that we picked this topic and I'm just, I'm just some, some of my favorite producers here as well. So, and I'm excited to do with Patrick. Patrick's been a mentor of mine for a while and the Wine and Food Foundation is a fantastic, fantastic uh, organization and I'm happy to do it anytime. Uh, so without further ado, um, I will look to share my screen. We'll see if this works. One second. So um, while I'm figuring this out, let's just kind of talk about uh, generally what the natural wine scene in uh, Austin is like right now. Uh, in the industry, we've always understood, like not always, but recently we don't see it as a new phenomenon. We've We've known about natural wines for the last 10 or 15 years and the nature that people see them um, now. Um, and let me see here. Uh, yeah, are you seeing what I'm seeing or is it sharing you? I apologize. Yep, we can see it. Oh, you can? Great. Um, great. So we will dive right in. Um, so the definition of natural wines to us is it kind of widely varies um, depending on who you talk to. So if you go into an unnamed natural wine bar or someone that kind of holds dear natural wines or they market them as such, I think that they would abide by the strict definition um, and and flavor profile that they're looking for, uh, and I think generally speaking, it's it, it's probably a more all inclusive way to say that we'd stick to the loose definition. Winemaking is really really hard overall, um, and natural wines in and of itself is not just earnest winemaking. Um, I think it is turned into marketing uh, and we need to figure out the difference between authentic natural wines that you enjoy and you want to put good things in your body versus things that are highly manipulated. And I think that, that we can all generally agree on that a big tent idea. So like in a strict definitions, uh, we're looking at wines that are farmed organically or biodynamically um, organics and biodynamics, the difference is really uh, in terms of doctrine, I think mostly uh, organic wines are there, depending on which certification is defining organics, it could be the European Union, it could be the United States, uh, it could be individual organizations. And depending on which list you're using, it could dictate uh, which. Is there some feedback? No. Okay. Um, it could dictate which chemicals or other additives you're allowed to use in viticulture or winemaking. Uh, and so all of it's very much subjective, uh, unless you have every single certification that everyone holds in high regard. And that kind of becomes a little uh, more bulletproof. But the strict definition would also include probably. Uh, 
wines that aren't filtered or fined um, and no sulfites. And that, that can be quite challenging. And I think some of the best natural wine producers that have come to create a really great reputation across the board have understood the use of sulfites in particular wines and the places where they can scale back because um, I, I think it, it's lost on people how, what sulfites are and what they do to you and how they could possibly harm you. Um, so a good test is uh, if someone says that they're allergic to sulfites or if there's there's uh, some, some issue with sulfites. I think if they can eat raisins, then sulfites not the issue. So raisins have dramatically more sulfites overall. Uh, and uh, not here to get into a discussion about whether sulfites really do hurt you or not. I think that sometimes there's a, quite a few things that are going on in wines and other additives that could be at issue and make you not feel so good, including maybe drinking the whole bottle. But we won't get into that. Um, the looser definition means that we're not necessarily counting uh, how many certifications you have because it's about how you operate and how you work um, and overall how you produce wines. And if you're producing them in a, an honest way to not add anything that would be harmful to you, um, I think that those producers should be just as respected, even if they don't have the same, we maybe kind of specific flavor profile. In terms of the definition of natural wines, is there anything you want to add? Um, I, I mean, obviously, uh, getting these certifications are take, take a long time, and they're very, very expensive too. So uh, you got to take that into consideration. Um, so, and then you know, obviously, you got people that are vineyards that are close together, what their neighbors are doing to their wines, whether they're spraying or not, that kind of thing. So all those things are taken into consideration. I think so. Agreed. So um, do these wines taste differently? Whether we're talking about a natural wine or a non-natural wine, uh, I don't think that even some of the best sommeliers would be able to, first of all, agree on a definition of what a natural wine is uh, and decide that that's what you're going to utilize. And it can't be based off of taste profile. I think taste profile is what leads people to think that wines may be a little more interesting than they are. So when in Tony and I shoes, we've tasted thousands and thousands of wines in the last year. Like put that in perspective, we've, we've understood what generally wines taste like, and then like what things come across as like faults or noble faults, things that can, you can um, recover or amend in a wine so that at their, the potential off aroma isn't included. And I think a, 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 the way I would train uh, someone new to wine about natural wines that maybe are marketable, more marketable now and pretty hot in Austin are like that kombucha or sour beer kind of flavor. Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily that the wine is better or healthier for you. Uh, and I think that you have a lot of wineries and estates and companies playing tricks on people too, because if they can replicate those flavor profiles, which are common uh, taste profiles that you can shoot for, just like if you wanted to make an oaky wine, you can make a recipe for that. Uh, the same thing is true is that you can make a kombucha sour beer style wine. It's actually much easier to make those wines uh, and then to kind of blow it off it. Like the reason they taste that way is because they're more complex. Uh, and that's not necessarily true. So we, I think we can all agree when it's 95 degrees on a patio in Austin, we want something crisp and refreshing. Um, but sometimes those nuances of flavors can be um, sold to us as being more complex when really it's, they're not that complex. Uh, they're not that different from if, you if we tasted a hundred wines that were trying to be a similar thing, that would be a bigger challenge for people, I think. Um, so short answer is it depends if there's a particular style of natural wine, uh, meaning like, uh, if you go to a natural wine bar, if they market themselves as such, uh, then those flavor profiles that we talked about, sour beer, kombucha, even things that are maybe even a little more funky than that. Um, those, those are the aromas and tastes that they're going for in terms of a natural wine. 
Um, but I think a better profile would be to find out the wine is natural after you taste it. Uh, like if someone just told you that, because I don't know very many people, if anyone that can point it out just on a, in a blind tasting format. Um, so I think that's really important to understand that just because a wine has that kombucha smell or taste, they still could be adding sulfites. There still could be chemicals and whatever used in uh, viticulture. So all of that I think is uh, worthy of saying. Any questions so far? Any uh, opinions you want to raise me with? Nope. So why does this all matter? I think that maybe it matters a little bit more to me than it does to and Tony to, than other people because we understand after tasting all these wines that this isn't something new. Do you want to add to that a little bit? Uh, I mean, I think there's always been kind of a discussion, obviously, around natural wine and what natural wine is and the definition going deeper into it of what that means. For me, a lot of the time, it's, it's meaning like, are you getting are you getting wine that tastes like wine and not wine that tastes like oak? I mean, there's a lot of things that can, uh, things like a lot of people that, you know, in the old world really concentrate more on what's happening in the vineyard and they use natural practices for that too. They really want to be able to, um, express a time and a place, uh, where, um, a lot of the time, you know, bottle age with, uh, maybe with, without sulfur can kind of change a wine as well. Um, so there's that discussion as well as all I can add to that. Yeah, I think uh, there's a social discussion happening right now. So there are people that come to me and say, man, we should make X restaurant a natural wine list. And uh, I think that that's well and fine. And I just, the follow-up question is, what exactly do you mean? Uh, because to me, that doesn't really tell me anything. We, we incorporate natural wines throughout all of our 16 restaurants. Um, but we do it based on quality first, um, uh, rather than finding out like what's the newest natural wine that has a cartoon label on the front of the bottle. Uh, so I, I think that natural wine, this is an important discussion because it's forcing old podgies like me to understand what it is about natural wines, the flavor profile, everything about the discussion and work them into how we understand and really appreciate traditional wines. And if you go to a natural wine bar and you love all these natural wines, but you can't appreciate something like one of these producers in the presentation, then I think that we're missing the boat quite a bit because it, there, there was something before the last five years. And the last five years has been the foundation of, uh, prior to that is the foundation of how winemaking has existed. I mean, uh, We'll kind of touch on that a little bit, but there also a seems. Quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask: it, at your restaurants, is there an easily identifiable way to determine which wines are naturally produced on your menus, or do you have to ask the sommelier? That's, that's a good question. At Jeffrey's, I'll let Tony talk to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think asking your sommelier would probably be the best bet. Um, and you just got to be really clear about what you're asking for. Um, obviously, I, we like to, and I know that um, Patrick makes a focus on uh, procuring producers that are responsible winemakers, which is also part of this whole discussion for me as well. Have you been responsible? Are you responsible? And are you not harming, you know, the earth and where all this, all this wine comes from and what creates the wine? Um, and, uh, so, I mean, it's depending, I mean, if you want biodynamic, if you want natural, if you want organic, there's certifications, there's a discussion over loot resin, resin a, which is also a uh, responsible farming practices, but kind of, um, depends on profitability as well. So, um, we can talk about that as well. And Patrick can probably expand on that as well. Yeah. So, uh, I think to answer your question specifically in regard to Jeffries, we have, a team of sommeliers every single night that you can ask them and and if we can't tell you then that's a problem but uh every single captain or uh, wine specific position will be able to point you in the right direction now there's a there's kind of a spectrum because there's a lot of restaurants but at lambert's we went as far as to say like we changed the list around 
we made that an entirely domestic list. So if you want to see a personification of like what this presentation is about, go to Lambert's uh, because uh, on the left side of the label or on the listing and the menu, it says natural just because we want to identify like the traditional domestic producers versus new school natural. And um, that would be a good menu to kind of go off of if you wanted to really try out like natural versus not uh, not, not necessarily natural. Um, and I would say specific restaurants is where I'd point you. And you should always ask the SOM if there's a SOM, but if there isn't one readily available, like go to the restaurants that will feature those styles. And I'd say that Lambert's, Jeffrey's and June's all day are the three restaurants in our group that do a better job than maybe other restaurants in the group, make it easier for you to tell the difference. Um, and then uh, when we open our undetermined new Italian restaurant uh, in a month, that will also be a good spot for them. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, yeah, so there seems to be a fissure happening between new school natural wine crowd and traditionalists and traditionalists, i.e. John Rennick at the Wine Merchant. That's just a little joke. Hopefully uh, he sees this at some point and he'll appreciate that. Um, but yeah, I think that there are people that uh, get on onto their soapbox and on either side and say natural wine doesn't matter or traditional wine doesn't matter. Uh, and I don't agree with either side of that. So where are we kind of now in the spectrum? This is a, not a super in-depth uh, timeline of events, but uh, at least we can generally go through it. Um, up until like the dawn of like boxed meals and chemicals and sulfites to preserve food and all of those things like pre-1950, depending on which country you're in, um, the wine has always been made in a super similar way. Um, maybe the only real difference is like whether you're putting wine underground versus like in big containers above ground, which could change the flavor profile quite differently, whether it's different grapes, but um, Wine has never been as specific as it is now. So we can go and get single vineyard, single grape variety, single vintage for sparkling wine, for still wine, uh, for fortified wine. So everything is very specific and finely, finely tuned. But um, centuries past, it's just been about picking grapes, uh, stomping the grapes and letting the native yeast, which, which no one really understood how that came to be for a really long time. It was basically magic that uh, grape juice would turn into alcohol. And so now we have this kind of return to hit like historical winemaking, which is just let it be, which is kind of the definition of Lut Resume uh, within reason. And then you have this change like around World War II where all of these chemicals and, and um, inventions are, are made and and put into all different parts of our lives uh, from anything we intake into our body. And I think that for about 40 to 50 years, we kind of let it go to these unreasonable levels. And it was right for the natural wine movement to check all of that, because I now like going to a local grocery store and grabbing like fruits and vegetables that weren't like doused in chemicals. And that's a good development, I think. Um, so that, that kind of change happened, it, it kind of was like put onto our plate and now we're like having to like separate from that. And now we're having to tell, like, now we're kind of seeing the light on the other end and saying like, we, no one really wants to ingest that. And we're, we're trying to find more economical ways of providing fresh, like foods and things to put into our body, um, so that anyone can enjoy them. Uh, and that, I think that has to do with like economic and social constructs too. But right now we're dealing with wine. And um, I think that the massive commercial winemaking really pushed it into another realm in the last 20 years. And these massive billionaire companies that produce wine, that 
is meant to be put on the grocery store shelf uh, or gas station shelf and you go in it's ten dollars you don't worry about it and there's there's a good thing about that like in terms of people in wine like we want people to be drinking wine but like i would rather like in all honesty i'd rather someone in texas create an unoaked cabernet that was just typified the grape and they didn't have to use any chemicals or whatever and i buy that as my 10 or 15 dollar wine um as opposed to like a mass produced wine that was so um messed with that it's just a recipe at the end of the day and it's it's like a, a tv dinner from the 1960s and there's so many chemicals and everything just tamped into that that uh it's, not, it's just not good for you so now we're in this time period where we exist that we're trying to depending on which city you live in and which part of the world you live in we're fighting this war between like what's more authentic to drink natural wines or traditional wines that have been around forever uh and i think what we're talking about on this presentation is that there's a lot of synergy between those two that we need to highlight is there anything yeah, and I think this movement has created even organic and natural practices and responsible practices for the large wineries, too. Uh, they've been forced to move in that direction. I mean, if you go to a large winery, which you can take a tour at any of them, um, they're going to tell you that they use a lot of organic and natural practices. It's kind of the same across the board, but even if they're not telling the truth 100%, they are being forced to move in that direction, which is great. Um, so they're using less chemicals. Chemicals are being banned. Uh, the whole Roundup thing was, uh, was a huge boon for everybody, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's even if you don't agree, even if you're not a, a natural wine person, you have to appreciate where this is taking our industry. So now, uh, let's, without further ado, let's, I'm sure you've already started drinking, but let's get into it. Um, so Revento C. Blanc, Blanc de Blanc, uh, the story of this producer is 500 years or so, um, a little over 500 years old, and it's always been a winemaking family tradition. I forget which generation it's on. It has to be like the 12th or 13th generation run by the head of the estate right now is Pepe Reventos. Um, and it's pretty amazing. Reventos was one of the producers that brought stainless steel to Spain in terms of clean winemaking, because that was another reason for like rustic old school wines in the old world was that they weren't using modern technology. And stainless steel doesn't take away anything from natural processes unless if we have any um, anyone that would disagree with that. But um, so Reventos went as far to say like they were part of a historic appellation that we know more closely associated with like mimosas and cocktails than we do with quality winemaking, which is the appellation of Cava. So Cava is one of the only regions or appellations in the world that isn't contiguous. So if you're looking at a map of Spain, I apologize, I don't have one. Um, it actually, there are different portions of Spain from uh, the area around Barcelona that goes all the way down to southwestern Spain, and they if you if you source grapes from anywhere in that in those areas, or if you're making wine anywhere in those areas, you can call it cava. So really, it's not an appellation, and as much as it's just Spanish sparkling wine, uh, generally speaking. But uh, you have really big producers like Cordon U. Uh, that are some of the biggest producers in the world. And they're, they're trying to offload as much sparkling wine at, at a basic level that's mass produced. And that's not something that we're here to defend, but a producer like Reventos is different. So Reventos said, Cava, you're not associating with what we really wanna do. So there were two things that happened. One was a quality minded uh, grower association called Corpinat was created with 10 growers. And they all said, we need to do things better uh, and that's one step in the right direction. Maybe Reventos took it quite a bit far, but they created their own appellation called Conca del Rio Anoya. Uh, and this is an appellation of one. So only Reventos is a part of it. And it dictates that you have to be biodynamic. You, you can't use international grape varieties. So the grapes that they use are native to um, 
the Rio Anoya, uh, the Pinetas area, and it is Girello, Parlata, Macabeo, uh, and they'll use other grapes. Uh, they use Monastrell for their rosé, and then they use some um, interesting grapes that you don't see very often, like Bastard Negra, um, in other cuvées that they make. But just talking about this, like you can go to the grocery store or or any wine store that has this and this will be the same price point as Cordonu, generally speaking and there's so much more quality in this estate and each bottle uh, that they produce because they have such a high tier for quality winemaking they're not using chemicals or pesticides they're not using other grapes they're not mass producing uh, and this is a vintage wine which is very difficult and expensive to make uh, and then the grapes here are Girello, Parlata, Macabeo. Girello being the most important grape uh, in this cuvee. And it's more, it's supposed to be kind of their like Chardonnay, the way you'd expect that to perform in Champagne. Um, and it, it is a little more aromatic, but fresh and fruity. But uh, as we were talking earlier, like this, this wine does not replace Champagne. This is a sparkling wine that tastes authentic and from the place it's mineral it's salty saline rocky it almost tastes more like a like a sparkling water it's so refreshing but there's still like tart fruits uh there's a little like floral quality um but really intense minerality and there's so much of that uh in this wine that shoots above its weight you want to say anything agreed yeah so uh yeah, we work with them uh, at, at almost all of our restaurants, mostly using the Reventos Rosé, but for this price, you can't beat it and uh, super high quality. You may love the uh, Austin Market, though. One of the, uh, the assistant, assistant. assistant wine banker lives here half the year. Yeah, yeah. Joseph Samso is an amazing guy, loves visiting the restaurants, loves Austin, and uh, that'll be a theme. With some of these. So uh, a sparkling wine that's Natural, normally we call that a, a pet nat that, that people would associate that that is the only kind of natural sparkling wine, but that's untrue. And even champagne can be really natural. Um, and so I think that this adds to this like feeling of this, this, has, this producer is such a high marker and bar for what they produce, uh, but this isn't, you know, this probably isn't gonna be found in your natural wine bars, your local natural wine bars. Next up, Kuhn Spa. All right, Kuhn Spa. So this is uh, a, a very old winery. This is uh, dates back to 1795. So this is was established in 1795. So they've been around a long, long time. That was actually named a domain in 1895. It was named uh, Kuhn Spa's from the marriage by marriage from the Kuhn's and the Ba's family. Um, and it sits at the top of a town called Husseren Le Chateau. Um, and it is one of the highest points in Alsace. Alsace is an amazing region that is actually the sunniest region. Uh, it gets the most sun of any region in France. It's got a, it's got a, one of the important things about it is it has a beautiful rain shadow from the Vosges mountains. So it doesn't get a lot of the bad weather. Those, those mountains just kind of block it. So it gets a, gets a lot of sunlight. So it's one of the riper expressions of um, of Riesling uh, and uh, noble varietals. So uh, great place. Um, uh, so it's 10 hectares total. So it's not a big, big uh, place. It's got 200 years of winemaking tradition, as you can see. Um, and it includes the uh, Grand Cru's of Eichenberg or Eichberg and Fursigberg. I said that right. Uh, we all know those, right? Yeah. yeah classic Alsatian uh, vineyards in, uh, in Alsace. So um, uh, it recently in 2004, it got sold to a famous wine uh, winemaker, uh, Jean-Baptiste Adam. Uh, so he is, they were, there was a lot of questions around if they were gonna keep all their, um, their natural winemaking and Lou Rizanet that they were using, but he has actually done a great job. They've actually, uh, become organically certified in 2007 and actually became biodynamically, biodynamically certified by Demeter in 2008. Um, so average vine age is 25 to 45 years. 
um, from a four hectare plot for their tradition. Uh, they have two, they have two kind of um, lines of wines that they do. They do the tradition line, uh, which is a little bit fresher, a little bit more easy drinking, drinks great young, where they have, and they have their Trois Chateau line that's a little bit more complex and from older vines. Um, so just fresh, easy drinking wines. Uh, and uh, based on what Tony was talking about, Alsace kind of fits in this pocket in France. So Alsace historically has gone back and forth between French and German control. So there's influence from both cultures. But um, one thing that really kind of protects it as this pocket of not, not saying they have it easier than others, but because the Vosges Mountains create this rain shadow on the Western portion, um, they don't deal with as much uh, rot and issues from uh, like Burgundy and Loire Valley and Champagne producers. Uh, the, the things that they worry about are frost and, and uh, winter coming early or winter popping up um, a little late in the spring, um, which can damage it multiple different ways. But one of the reasons that it's, it fits in this pocket. And one of the reasons why Alsatian producers were some of the first to switch to biodynamics is they don't have as many viticultural hazards as uh, other regions have. And so um, it's easier to convert to biodynamics and less risky. Uh, if you're in another region and you're in a expensive region, you if you are thrust into the decision about whether you're just gonna lose your harvest because you don't have chemicals to control it, a lot of producers would say, unfortunately, we just have to use chemicals this year uh, in order for us to keep going as an estate, especially if you're small. Uh, and in Alsace, they have a few, I won't say crutches, but maybe a little bit of a crutch uh, that it's not as difficult as some other regions like the, the ones I mentioned. So you'll find a lot of the producers in Alsace are going to be biodynamic and they've been biodynamic for quite a long while and one of the leading producers in biodynamics uh, was in Umbrecht um, and they've been producing those wines that way for 30 or 40 years so definitely not a new kid on the block and definitely not a wine I would expect to see at a natural wine bar. Moving into Sang de Caillou Cuvée Lopi. And any questions about the first two wines? Any thoughts, taste profile, anything like that that you wanted to hit on? Can you guys just um, maybe give it a short definition of biodynamic? Because um, I feel like the terms organic and biodynamic kind of get tossed around. I feel like I understand organic, but I don't know that I really have like a great comprehension of what it means to be biodynamic. Yeah, that's a great question. So organics, um, I would say is a, uh, like a general term uh, unless it's uh, certification. And I think biodynamics is a particular doctrine that you're prescribing to. So basically you're doing almost everything the same way, except that in biodynamics, you're using almost like these nine magic formulas um, that are that are prescribed by this doctrine that goes back over a hundred years that says, these are the different prescriptions we have that are totally natural based. Um, that say like, if you have rot or if you have like particular uh, viticultural hazards go on in the vineyard, this is how you defeat it. Uh, and they're really, really hard to follow. And it's, a lot of it's kind of like gypsy stuff uh, it's really bizarre. Like they'll pick things based on the moon cycles. Like these are not things that I think mainstream wine drinkers would understand how kind of crazy and in tune with nature it's, it's setting out to be. And so basically it's this name brand recipe that has been outlined that says, this is, this is how you fight off disease, or this is how you go about like every step of the way. Um, and I think that most producers that follow biodynamics would say like, we generally understand that these things are gonna help our viticulture and winemaking. It's really, really hard, but like they're not, not all of them are into the gypsy like crazy stuff that you can kind of pull out. Like 
um, one of the prescriptions says that you uh, bury uh, a uh, called cow horn, cow horn with manure, and you bury it into the ground, and that's uh, the for like one of the first prescriptions, and I forget what it fights off, but there are very specific like um, recipes that kind of go a little far. And you can and you can hear different viewpoints of it as well. Like that, for some people, they say that a lot of this stuff creates a certain biochemistry in the soil, and it creates living organisms in the soil. So the soil is constantly a living thing and it like creates those that biosphere inside the soil so bearing that you know i don't know what the cow horn exactly i'm sure there's an explanation for that but the, you know, the fertilizer in there and uh, the manure in there definitely can you know increase the bio biodiversity of the soil um rudolf steiner is the guy that kind of wrote the book well austrian viticulturalist and um and uh, it's, I think there was a book that's written that's, uh, that people go by. And you know, a lot of it, yeah, the lunar calendar, they pick according to the lunar calendar and everything, so. Yeah, um, so just to get more specific, cow horns are stuffed with special compost preparations. After being buried for a time, the contents are used to make a tea for fertilizing the vineyard. And it goes way more intense than that, but that's kind of the funniest, uh, kind of hopefully expresses how bizarre it can go um but they're each of them are the kind of prescriptions and there's i think nine or ten of them um but yeah does that help answer the question yeah it does thank you i, I think i i like weird dirt tasting teas so maybe that's why i like biodynamic wines <laughs> it smell like manure <laughs> yeah yeah um great uh, well, anyone else have any questions so far? I have a question about um, sort of market uh, adaption or adoption of natural wines and, and how you market natural wines to a population that maybe doesn't, doesn't think they should be caring so much about natural wines. So, you know, are, are you seeing that people actually care about this and are looking for natural wines? And if not, how do you get them to care about this when they, when they're always looking for the, the familiar labels that are mass produced because they know that's what they like? Yeah, I think uh, that's kind of the funny thing about living in Austin is that we're actually having the reverse problem, like not problem, it's reverse kind of conversation where it's like, people are coming in asking for natural wines uh, and that's how they got into wine. And so we don't like, I think that discussion about like how to back them back into like somewhat traditional natural winemaking producers that have been doing this for hundreds of years is a more difficult conversation. I think it depends on the city. So like New York was the first, New York city was the big first city that kind of like, drove this and so sommeliers were aware of natural wines and aware of these producers 10 12 years ago um and then it kind of like in austin it's kind of slowly seeped in in the last 18 months and right now we're not at fever pitch i don't think yet but we're pretty close to this point where like it is it's pretty intense that people are coming in and asking for natural wines because they went to a natural wine shop or they went to a natural wine uh, bar and they got these and it's, they're trying to replicate, I think a lot of times the flavors, the kombucha, the sour beer thing. Um, and then it's harder to give them traditionally made wines because that's not how all wines taste. And on the converse, if you're used to drinking traditionally made wines, it's harder for you to drink kombucha, sour beer style wine. So I don't know that I would necessarily push people in natural wines or want to. It's more so like, I'd rather you drink wines that you want to drink. Um, and I think part of this presentation is kind of like, we're, we're trying to point out that it does like just like going into a wine restaurant or going into a wine bar and saying, I want a natural wine doesn't give us enough information other than like, then we have to ask multiple questions about, it would just be like, uh, 
yeah, I, I think that it doesn't give us a lot of information to go off of because we don't know if you're saying kombucha style aromas, which don't have to be necessarily naturally made wines. There are producers, unnamed producers in California that have understood that the marketing behind natural wines is so strong that they can just make these kombucha style wines, but put chemicals and sulfites in them. And no one would question it because it has a funny cartoon label on the front of the bottle. Um, and it tastes the way that they remember those wines tasting. So it's a, it's a kind of a hard thing. I more so, this is just about consumer insight. Like I want everyone to realize this isn't a new thing. Uh, and I'm not necessarily pushing people toward natural wine. I want, I want people to be curious as curious as it, they can be without losing their appetite. So that's a good thing. Thank you. Uh, so next wine is Sang de Caillou, Cuvée Lopi from Vacaras. So hopefully a lot of you are familiar with Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, and that's the first demarcated wine appellation in France. And it's in Southeastern France uh, near the city of Avignon. Uh, and this producer is super cool. Um, Sang de Caillou means blood of the stones. It was a uh, uh, formed uh, head of the state between a gentleman and Serge uh, Fergoul. Um, Serge is the head of the state and his family runs it. His son kind of over time is being passed the baton. Um, and Serge is a big, rustic, wiry mustache. Uh, and he speaks uh, no English or very, very few words of English. And you could tell all he's ever been doing is farming and picking grapes. And it's the most rustic, like old school personification of winemaking that I can think of. Um, and so he's the icon of this estate. So it's an interesting thing about Appalachians in France. So Chateau Neuf de Pape was founded around the turn of the century in the early 1900s. Um, and that was the first Appalachian. And everyone kind of knows it as the home of the Pope or the second home of the Pope um and when the pope lived in france and uh so there are there are appellations next to it that are called uh, kind of generally surrounding it that's called Côte de Rhone. and then there are Côte de Rhone village as well as other appellations and the Côte de Rhone village is basically like different sections around chateau neuf de pop that say like okay we just want to say what village this is from and vacaras used to be one of those villages until it was elevated to its own AOP. Um, and that happened in 1992 when Serge took full control of the state. And uh, basically Sang de Caillou is the reason why Vacaras is an appellation, but this is super synonymous with Chateau Neuf de Pop in terms of winemaking and what you'd expect. So predominantly Grenache, 75% uh, Grenache, 25% Syrah. Um, and the kind of the history of the estate is about 50 years old, um, but they've always been organically farming. And they, the, the guy with the super sunburned skin that looks like leather and a rustic wiry mustache and like dirt and like just a farmer, like he doesn't care about certifications, but he's been doing things as natural as possible for a really, really long time. Uh, and so this is kind of an untouched, there's no new oak, there's no, there's no fining or filtering. It's just like rustic Southern French red blend um, that's made in a non-interventionist and organic, healthy way. Um, so let's go in and taste. So Grenache is driven by strawberry. It's a thin skin red grape, but has uh, uh, the ability to accumulate a lot of alcohol. So usually these wines are 15% or around there. And Syrah is a good counterpart because it's a thick skin grape, um, but it has this black, black, black pepper and iron and all these like meaty aromas. And so those things together create kind of this like rustic old world red wine that has red fruits and black fruits. Uh, and it starts dark on the nose and dirty, and then you taste it and it finishes like tart and fresh and lighter than I think you think. Pretty uh, straightforward, super high quality. The wines are just uh, rotating between, uh, there's nothing really different about the wines other than he changes the 
Cuve name between his daughters and Lopi is one of his daughter daughters. Um, and so there's nothing super profound about that. And it's just very simple. He's not trying to complicate it. And I think finally he has an organic certification, but just because the peer pressure is so intense in France, but uh, for the longest time he didn't have one. And uh, I can always trust these wines to be true of place and to represent like, if you like Bordeaux, you like Chateau Notre Pop, you like these bold red wines that offer this earthiness, like, I trust this producer more than almost any. Questions, thoughts, Tony? I Yeah, no, I agree wholeheartedly. These wines just represent incredible value. Um, I have sold these to many people who wanted uh, incredible value and complexity at, at a, a good price point. So yeah, amazing wine. Um, yeah, I'd say like, you like obviously anyone that has this wine bought it from Austin Wine Merchant and the price like I think shoots above its weight even if it is the most expensive of this foursome um but really high quality wine you can put these wines down just like you would Bordeaux and drink them in five years and they'll be that much better or 10 years 20 years I've had really old bottles of this and it's awesome uh but some cross between old world and new world wine because it is a pretty warm region Moving on, the conclusion, the the icon of old school natural wines. And I apologize, I guess I repeated the picture. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm sure uh, Patrick will attest to the fact that how much I love these wines and how much I sell. He sells way too many. I sell Jeffries. so much Musar. It's crazy. I love this wine so much. It's got it's one of the most complex wines and talk about value these wines are amazing and the history in this winery is incredible i mean one of the easiest wines to create a relationship with and that's what i love to do is as a sommelier at a restaurant on the floor is my job to create a relationship with the consumer to the wine uh, and it just makes it so much more special and these wines add so much to that uh, musar so obviously we know that um, so it's crazy because lebanon has been making wine for so long uh, it's one of the oldest wine regions in the world. I mean, we, we think of Lebanon as not being old world, uh, but we, I would, I would, and I'm sure Serge and Gaston would have called it uh, uh, ancient world wine because they've been making wine in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia for five to 6,000 years. Uh, and it kind of, as it grew, it kind of passed on to Lebanon. Um, and so these wines are amazing. Now, now Gaston was, uh, an incredible guy who actually started his wine, started making wine in 1930 at 20 years old. Uh, there was a French occupation in, uh, uh, in, in Lebanon at that point, and he was actually making wine and supplying the French soldiers with wine at that time. Super, super cool. He actually met uh, Ronald uh, Barton of Chateau Langoa Barton at that time, became really good friends with him. And that really enhanced his love of, of Bordeaux varietals, Bordeaux wines, Bordeaux style wines. Um, and so he uh, traveled to Bordeaux, he got more inspired and just loved it. And so um, always made his wines kind of a natural fashion, made them really kind of, uh, uh, kind of terroir driven. Um, the Bacaw Valley has um, really good elevation. I mean, so this Bacaw Valley is kind of sandwiched between two 10,000 foot high mountain ranges. So on the Syria side and on the, the so other side. So, and it's super cool uh, terroir there too. So the Lebanon is 120 miles of coastline and 30 miles wide. So really incredible, just like Chile is like, it's, I think it's just overlooked as a wine region that I, and people are always satisfied with this. So um in 1950 oh so i think it was 1959 uh he passed along his his son serge uh wanted to take over he was uh going to the university of bordeaux and learning from emile panaud over at the uh university of bordeaux and he actually asked his father to quit because he had such a passion for wine he wanted to take over the the domain so uh gaston uh passed along to him in 1959 and he started putting in a lot of uh, natural practices 
he didn't add sulfites at all. And you can kind of tell when you taste the whole, and one of the coolest things about this domain and Chateau Moussard, you can taste old vintages so easily. You can find them just about everywhere uh, because they always held back vintages and always they're always in the market. Like we always have an old vintage. I got a chance to taste a 1969 next to an 89 Palmer. And it was, I, I, would, I would put it up against that any day of the week. It was amazing. Uh, so they just age really well, even though there's no sulfites, which is really really amazing uh well in one thing to note that there's no additional sulfites yeah. so yeah. The, the natural sulfites that come from grape skins uh can be utilized in red wine making a lot easier than like you'd utilize in white wine and they and they add they add some like a little bit of sulfite now because i think when they started import, like exporting all over the world they wanted there to be more uh, less bottle variation and just kind of more dependable uh, uh flavor characters so uh, this, this particular wine is the June. So uh, uh, let's, and to finalize what, you know, Serge was an amazing guy. He used to love coming to Austin. He used to come to Austin all the time. He loved Austin. He died in a, a tragic boating accident in 2014, which is crazy because, I mean, these guys were carrying grapes, you know, through the Lebanon during the wars. You know, they actually, they have an 18th century castle that his cousin had that they take the grapes from the Caw Valley and it takes a three hour journey to, to the, the chateau. Uh, and they actually use the chateau as an air raid shelter for the villagers in Gazan uh, in the wars. So super cool history there. And um, Serge uh, won Decanter uh, Winemaker of the Year in 1984. Yeah, he was the first Decanter Man of the Year. And uh, he did that while they were in the middle of a civil war and he was producing world-class wines. Super, super cool. Um, so this particular wine is the June uh, uh, line, and this is just meant to be drunk a little bit younger, um, more fresh, um, and doesn't age as probably as well as the Musar. Um, it's cement uh, line vats, uh, uh, bottled one year after uh, aging in the in those vats, and then uh, one year after bottling, they release it. Uh, there's no fining, no filtering. Um, this is 50% Cinso, 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 30% Syrah, a uh, vine age of approximately about 21 years. Uh, so um, it's really, they've kept this the same tradition going for years and years and years of supernatural winemaking. So. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, they really have been the producer that people look to. Like, I'd say they're even more consistent than almost every other house in Bordeaux other than first growths. Uh, but those first growths, unfortunately, used a lot of chemicals and pesticides in Bordeaux and, and uh, Gaston and Serge never wanted to do that. Um, and now it's into the next generation. And uh, we recently, prior to the world going, uh, catching on fire, we had a dinner with um, um, Mark uh, Hochar. Um, we did a vintage, very uh, introspective at 12 different vintages. And, the wines are always so interesting to get into. They harvest, so there's three lines. There is this line, um, that's the Jeune. There is the next line, which is the Gaston Hochar, which is instead of Syrah, it is uh, Grenache. And then for the regular Moussar, every single year, it's Cabernet, Carignan, Cinso, which is a blend that no one else utilizes consistently in any other region that I can think of. Um, and so they, the really interesting thing about those wines is that all the vintages taste so different because they harvest all three of the grapes at the same time. So that means if we know anything about phenolic ripeness, sometimes grapes are healthier when they're picked in like the first week of October or the first week of September, depending on the vintage and the weather and what's going on. Uh, and they pick them everything at the same time. So sometimes the start of the vintage could be Carignan or it could be Cinso, or it could be Cabernet. So it's kind of fun to pick out when you try 12 different wines, which wines are driven by which grapes. Uh, and that adds to the natural like stability of the wines. Like I think that they're always gonna be different. They're always gonna be like a factor of that vintage. Um, but overall, like they're not adding anything to it as organic as possible. Um, and they're doing some biodynamic processes, but they're not advertising it. Um, yeah, I think we could go on and on, but at the end of the day, it's 
super classy. Yeah, and, and they were, let's let's add to that and into this discussion with it. It was, they were the first uh, organically certified winery in Lebanon in 2006. So, and, and at that time, very few people were caring about the certification. So uh, definitely ahead of their time, but long story short, uh, you wouldn't find this necessarily at your local natural wine store or wine bar. And I think that this whole presentation in class was about pushing those limits that realize that like, it's not just if you've been making wine for a long time, you're not doing it the right way. More than likely, if you've been making it longer, you've been doing it the right way for a longer amount of time. So um, it's, it's fun to showcase the, these producers and others um, and uh, challenge yourselves. Uh, drink what you want to drink, drink what tastes good, drink what you know um, are, you're not putting harmful things in your body. Adding to that, I mean, obviously, the older these wineries are, the older the vines are, I mean, the, the, the more complex they get, obviously. We know this, we're all wine people, and we know that the deeper these roots reach, the more complex they get. So um, unless they're tearing those vines out and planting something new, I mean, it's, it's, it's you would really want to highlight that. So you're not trying to, like, you're not trying to cover it with anything. So any thoughts or questions, strong opinions? Thank you for sharing all of this. I appreciate it. I'm, you know, not a kombucha style natural wine connoisseur. Um, you know, and the whole time I'm usually yelling, what about all these funny funny wines? So I really, I appreciate the, the time that you guys have put into this because it's, it's a very important part of our business that's not discussed that often with the consumer, unfortunately. I do think as people become more into wine, they become more educated and they start to explore more. And that's when wines like this really should shine like they do. Thank you, Sansi. We Thank love you. you. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. John Rennick, great John Rennick quote. Was showing him wines that were natural. First wine I ever showed him that was natural. And in true John fashion, he just said, Sansi, I like my wines with the side of sulfur. You know what? Of course you do, John. Uh, of course you do. <laughs> I would so, love, I would love to do a blind tasting with John to see if I could get him to say yes to some natural wines, though. I think you could. I think you very well could. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Thank you, Sansi. Yeah, I think a blind tasting is really the way to go with stuff like this, where you know people are don't have any preconceived notions about natural versus, you know, additives and sugar and pesticides. Like, it's just, do you like this wine? And that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, and again, I mean, obviously there's such a difference, like me as, as someone that's on the floor constantly being asked these questions, I always am asking, you know, are you looking for you know, responsible farm, like there's a difference between natural wine and natural farming, and natural winemaking processes. Some, some use responsible methods in the vineyard. Some use responsible methods in the winery. Some don't use either, um, but you always hear the same thing going to wineries. So you just got to make sure that what you're getting is what you're looking for and just being clear about what you need. Um, I mean, I, I, I really make it a point to I, I was lucky enough to go to Australia years back and, and learn about these things hands-on uh, while, while in vintage and learning about responsible practices. And it just makes a huge difference. And to me, that's a big part of natural winemaking and organic winemaking. And is yeah. that something where you, you've you served someone a natural wine because, um, because of their wine tastes that they've told you about and then you've, then you've told them later, like, how did you like that wine? Did you know it was a natural wine? Like, are people ever surprised by that? I mean, yeah, again, it's, you know, some people aren't, aren't hundred percent clear. So it, it, obviously there's people that are looking for that kombucha kind of, kind of uh, tasting wine, which is super reductive and super, you know, funky. And, you know, some people, I've had people ask me for wines that give me the, the footiest wine you have. I've had every kind of, <laughs> Uh, as description, I had a guy a couple of weeks ago ask me for the footiest wine I had. Uh, so that's always a fun one, you know, and there's uh, winemakers that are super adventurous, like Cornelius. Yeah. And, you know, so, I mean, it's, 
there's so many variations of natural, fun, playful, responsible. I mean, it's just this, there's whole, um, you know, just smorgasbord of words you can use to, to describe what you want in your wine. And that's always best to make it clear with, this, with the sommelier what you're looking for. Yeah, I don't think uh, if I'm painting one broad stroke, I'd say that if someone says, give me your most natural wine, like I want to be like blown away. Basically, they want all the faults and as many like funky things coming out of the wine as possible. But after a while, they get bored of that because they realize that a lot of the aromas that they're getting in a spectrum of wines, maybe they're paying more, maybe they're paying less. A lot of those things start to fall in line, just like manipulated wines from like mass production wineries start to taste the same way. So like, don't, don't be the hypocrite that says like, you want natural wines because they're all different when a lot of those aromas end up being the same uh, and you maybe give people grief um, for drinking a gas station Merlot that's 10 bucks uh, and it tastes the same as all other wines, but it's like, you know what? I, I think there, there are really good natural wine producers. They're really hard to find and they get snatched up right away. Um, and it's a really hard process to be a really good producer and to make really authentic natural wine, uh, no expense spared. And those wines, there's not a lot of them. Like if we want to say like, oh man, that's a great enterprise. Like I want to invest $50 million in you. It's like, well, then we're going to need a ton more people and a lot more vineyards. And it's just, it's not an enterprise where you're trying to make money. You're just trying to be authentic so it's the bigger the operation the harder it is to make art artisanal natural products any anyone feel differently anyone any thoughts it's very small is all we need what very, very small. small is all we need any other um Kind of final takeaways or or uh, for our last sip anyone have anything to share that they've learned tonight or any big takeaways from anyone well i really enjoyed all of these wines um i would say i you, you used a term a couple times that i haven't heard before which was rain shadow and i don't even know if i want you to define it because it's just such a beautiful like when you kept saying it i was like oh rain shadow that's so so lovely. So I'm just going to let it like kind of sit out there with my ideas of a uh, biodynamicism and like organic wines, but that, that stuck with me. So thank you. And I, I really loved um, this Sang de Caillou, which is what blood of the rocks, yep. which is also very poetic. So I'm going to just sit with blood of the rocks and rain shadow. And those are my takeaways. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you. I also really love the timeline. I love seeing kind of, you know, the sort of history geek in me, like that, you know, that sort of mid-century, mid to late century time frame when, when preservatives and additives were happening, you know, throughout the food industry. Of course, it makes sense that that's when it was starting to really become a thing um, for, for wine. Um, and that then it's sort of, you know, reverting back to um, becoming more natural again. And it's just kind of fascinating to see that happen. Absolutely. Who doesn't like a good TV dinner? <laughs> Swanson's. <laughs> Swanson's. Hungry, hungry man. Yeah. The TV dinners of wine. I love that. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for being here. We really appreciate it. This was incredibly interesting and a, kind of a new take on it for me and um we really enjoyed having you we appreciate your time thank you we're thank you. we're really happy to do this and uh so shameless plug the women of wine we're doing a feature at june's all day where uh on our june zine we're doing um all different women in wine and mostly winemakers uh and come in and drink some female made wine when is that uh, it started last Friday uh, and also follow our Instagram because we have, it, it'll run for 10 weeks. And so each week we're going to do a different featured uh, woman 
uh, that will talk about some questions like whether it's their favorite wine, a wine off the zine that they want to drink. Uh, and today we just launched our first one with Andrea Molyneux of South Africa. And next week, uh, Silvio Tare from, from California and South Africa. California and South Africa. Sorry. <laughs> I had to plug my state. <laughs> but yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks for, for plugging that. That'll be a good one to, to check out. Well, thank you again. We appreciate you guys being here and thank you to our guests for participating and we look forward to seeing you hopefully next week. See y'all. Everyone, have a great night. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>